you've been waiting a while, I'm going to make it worth your while. <laughs> okay, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some real fun. You can ask any questions you want to after I've finished. Uh, if you really want to interrupt me, you can, but otherwise I'll leave plenty of time to ask questions. And when the questions can be on anything, uh, including Parliament or whatever. So I've titled this Boldness in Business. How many of you actually run your own businesses already? Can I just see some hands? Uh, quite a few. You'll identify with a lot of this. Uh, now, does this work? That works, so don't worry, I can use this. Okay, Duke of Wellington, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo yesterday. There's the Royal Gallery in the House of Parliament. And um, today I was uh, taking the Indian Foreign Secretary around. And I said, in the Royal Gallery, uh, Nicholas Sarkozy spoke there. And on one side, um, you have a painting of the Battle of Waterloo. On the other side, the Battle of Trafalgar. Two great French defeats. Use the mic. Now, where's the mic? Can you hear me now? OK. So one side, Battle of Waterloo, other side, Trafalgar, two great French defeats. In fact, President de Gaulle, when he was invited to speak in Parliament, refused to speak in that hall. <laughs> anyway, the Duke of Wellington, that was his motto. Fortune favors the brave. Fortune favors uh, the bold. Professor Clay Christensen, OK. Anyone here studied at Harvard Business School at all? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. OK, I'm an alumnus of this place. I'm very proud of it. I'm also an alumnus of Harvard Business School through executive education. I did a course there lasting nine years. I'm a slow learner. And <laughs> the final lecture was given by this, you've heard of Professor Craig Christensen, yeah? So he came in, I'll never forget this, tall, tall man, giant, six foot eight. Mm -hmm. And he said, I apologize. This is my first lecture uh, in a long time because I've been very ill. I had cancer, I beat the cancer, and then I got a stroke. And I've just recovered from the stroke. He said, you can see it hasn't affected my movements, but it's affected my brain. When I speak, sometimes I can't find the words I'm looking for. If that happens in this talk, he said, please shout them out. It might save some time. We had to shout out the words many, many times. At the end of the talk, he was in tears, and we were all in tears. And it's a talk I wish I'd heard much earlier in my life. And the message of the talk is very simple. Have you ever stopped and thought, what is the purpose of my life? And I ask you this question, how many of you honestly stopped and thought, what is the purpose of your life? It's a very individual question. There's no right or wrong answer here. And linked to that, how will you measure your life? So just keep that in perspective and the back of your mind while we go through this. Aspiration, inspiration, perspiration, partnership. You know, 99% perspiration, it's real. <laughs> this was our first company car. And uh, Albert. Albert was bright, green, battered. This is a touched up photograph. Um, and it cost 295 pounds, and we needed to push start it every day. And uh, you could see the road through the holes in the floor of the car when you're driving, if you look down. And we'd park it a little ahead of the restaurant so they didn't see the delivery vehicle, the most expensive ever <laughs> Indian beer. And it failed its MOT three times, and we eventually abandoned Albert. And Early on in our business, my partner Arjun and I both from Hyderabad in India, and we found a Hyderabad the entrepreneur in Leeds and discovered, and he actually went to the boarding school that I went to. We phoned him up and said, look, we're two young guys starting business. Can you give us some advice? He said, okay, come and see me in Leeds. So we drove in Albert, drove to the station, parked the car, got on the train to Leeds. We got to Leeds, got out of the train, and he picked us up in his very smart car. And we drove through the streets of Leeds to his house. And on the way, he said, you see that house? I own that house. I own those two houses. Drove a little further. I own the whole of that street. I own half of that street. Got to his house. He owns, two, at that stage, 250 properties in Leeds. His business model was very simple. He used to rent these houses out to Leeds University as student accommodation. Safe tenant, regular repeat orders, multimillionaire. Sitting at his kitchen table, he said, I've nearly lost everything. He was a name at Lloyd's. In those days, we were name at Lloyd's insurance. It was unlimited liability. And many, many ancient families in this country lost their fortunes overnight. And he said, I was a name at Lloyd's, very prestigious. I nearly lost everything. He said, what I've noticed with successful entrepreneurs is they have one quality that sets them apart, one word. He says, very short word, 
guts. They have the guts to do it in the first place. Everyone has, lots of people have ideas. How many people have the guts to actually put those ideas into action, to give up their jobs or whatever else they're doing to pursue that dream? So the guts to do it. But he said, more importantly, they have the guts to keep going when other people would give up. And I've nearly lost my business three times. And he couldn't have been more correct throughout that journey I've been on. Blue Ocean Strategy. I mean, those of you who studied at this business school would have, well, you can lecture me about Blue Ocean Strategy. Yeah, but it, the message here is very simple. It, got, it came home to me, my daughter, older daughter who actually goes to Wellington School, which was founded by Queen Victoria in memory of the Duke of Wellington. And I said, Dad, Dad, I'm going to make some money to pay for some of the trips this summer holiday. I said, wow, at long last, you know. <laughs> and she has found this site where she's selling her many, many clothes that she no longer likes on this site. So I said, oh, you're doing it on eBay. She said, no, 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 Dad, it's a new site, not eBay. It's some new site that makes 50 pence on every transaction, and you sell secondhand clothes. And it's amazing. And she's already made hundreds of pounds doing this. Now, how can you compete against an eBay that's been around a big giant? So how do these things happen? Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Facebook, MySpace was already huge. Social networking was huge when, when Facebook started. There were many social networking sites. I remember doing a case study here at London Business School on Friends United. And yet he builds a company that is now one of the biggest brands in the world. So applying Blue Ocean strategies, doing something differently, doing something better, changing the marketplace forever. And another person who I've met called Guy de la Liberté, French-Canadian, and he's built a business where he was a street performer, and then he decided to put together this product that's theater, opera, gymnastics, acrobatics, ballet, musical, Cirque du Soleil. One billion dollar business mm. today. Every one of the elements, every one of the elements in Cirque du Soleil um, existed before, but no one had put them together in the way that he had. And with Cobra Beer, is very much a Blue Ocean strategy product, because my idea is very simple. Uh, just to expand on what you said. I came here as a 19-year-old from India. Um, I skipped a couple of years of education, skipped my equivalent of A-levels, went to university at 16, graduated at 19, and came here and then qualified as a chartered accountant with Ernst & Young of the city, did a law degree at Cambridge. And my dissatisfaction as a consumer was with beer in this country. The lagers that I was presented when I went into pubs were terrible. They were gassy, fizzy, harsh, bland, bloating. I found them difficult to drink. Then I used to go to Indian restaurants. I couldn't cook when I came here. Indian food, spicy, hot, you want something cold, refreshing, lager. Except the lager that I was given was bland, harsh, fizzy, and bloating. Bloating lager, spicy food, uncomfortable. So an English friend of mine introduced me to real ale. How many of you here like real ale? Anyone like real ale? few hands, I love the stuff. Took an instant liking to it. But I found that I could drink ale in a pub, delicious, smooth, easy to drink. But with food, I found the ale too heavy and too bitter. And that's when this idea evolved, when I was actually at Cambridge. And it was not a eureka moment. I didn't go running through the streets of Cambridge naked. <laughs> it, it evolved. And the idea was, why don't I produce a beer that has the refreshment of a lager and the smoothness of an ale combined that would appeal to men and women alike, have a globally appealing taste, and accompany all food, and in particular, Indian food. So really simple idea. Um, this word serendipity. If I were to ask you, define the word serendipity. Anyone tell me what does serendipity mean? Yes? Fortunate accident. Fortunate accident. Brilliant. Fortuitous. <coughs> okay. Lucky. Lucky. Mark Durand, who I work with at Cambridge, I've just taken over as chair of the Judge Business School Advisory Board at Cambridge. Mark Duron's spoken about serendipity being seeing what everyone else sees, but thinking what no one else has thought. Think about it. And the best definition of luck that I've ever heard, by the way, I never did a case study on luck at London Business School. I haven't done a case study on luck at any business school. There's so much luck that comes into the story. And in fact, Mark Durand has just written a paper on luck. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, the best of luck is when determination meets opportunity. And I picture that as waves going past you. And if you're determined, you might just catch one of those waves. And I had a lot of luck in my story. 
The first business venture you heard was importing polo sticks from India. It was great. Not a big market, <laughs> polo sticks. <laughs> but the margins I made on those polo sticks selling them to Harrods I'll never make again. <laughs> I used to buy them for one pound, sell them to Harrods for 15 pounds, and Harrods would sell them to customers for 33 pounds. <coughs> Small market though. And then when I wanted to do the beer idea, if we stumbled across, I mean, it was, we had a mentor, and our mentor lived not far away from here, um, Uncle Keshav Reddy, who was a retired wing commander from the Indian Air Force, Royal Indian Air Force fighter pilot, worked around the world after he left the Air Force. And we used to go and see him regularly. And, you know, normally we'd go and see, and, you know, this chap had lost both his legs through diabetes, and yet he traveled the world. He never complained. We'd go into study, come on in, boys, sit down, big smile. Tell me your problems. Oh, Uncle Keshav. We run out of money again. <laughs> so, uh, so then one day we said, Uncle Keshav, we've got a great idea. Now the beer was a big idea. We we're waiting to get some experience. Said, Uncle Keshav, great idea. We want to import seafood from India. Ah, seafood from India, we won't believe this. One of my best friends was sitting where you're sitting and he's just opened a seafood factory in Kerala. And he said, if you know anybody who wants to import seafood, put them in touch with me. And he rummaged around, there was a brochure the friend had left, he couldn't find the brochure. He said, I'll send it to you. Next day, we received the brochure in the post. Pals Seafood. This factory, these seafood products. I said, this is great. I said, Pals, Pals, Pals. Why does it ring a bell? Got to the end of the brochure. Pals Seafood, a division of Mysore Breweries Limited, the brewers of the famous Pals beer. And that's a beer that I'd known from the Indian Army messes. My father's in the Indian Army. I said, Arjun, my, to my partner, forget the seafood. This is my beer idea. Uncle Keshav, we're not interested in seafood. Would they be interested in exporting beer to us? He phoned them. He said, I phoned them. Phoned them. He said, yeah, they were interested in talk. Now, here's the luck. Look at the serendipity there. Look at the luck there. They'd never exported beer before. They were the biggest independent brewer in India. They were doing really well. Their brand, Pals, they said, look, you can have Pals. Sorry, name of a dog food in Britain. Oh, then you can have our best-selling brand. We'll export that to you called Knockout. Knockout was an 8% lager, <laughs> and the label was one boxer having knocked out another boxer. <laughs> Thank you very much. They said, OK, look, you are 27 years old, you and your partner. You've got no money. You've got no experience in our industry. Everyone has failed except for Kingfisher. You're going to fail. And if you fail, it's your brand that will fail, not ours. Do it. Choose your own brand. Look at the luck there. If it was one of their brands, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I would have just been an agent or a distributor. Our most valuable asset is a Cobra beer brand. Next bit of luck, they had the best brewmaster in India, Dr. Karayapa. He'd spent six years in the Czech Republic, the home of Pilsner beer, at Prague University, PhD in brewing, the scientists, biochemists. He knew everything about beer. I learned everything. The first trip I went to the brewery, and I parked myself there, was with a bag full of, in my hand luggage, 30 carefully selected bottles of beer. And I sat in the laboratory with him and I said, this is this extra smooth taste I've got in my mind, and went through beer by beer to try and explain it to him. So the luck played a big part in the story. There's another word. We were, while I was there at the knockout derby, <laughs> the races in Bangalore, I was sitting next to one of Bangalore's most well-known industrialists at the time, and he said, young man, you're embarking on a business journey. Remember, empires are built on trust. Empires are built on trust. The recipe for Cobra, that's any Germans over here in this room? Any Germans? Germans? No? Well, this is a German beer, very simple. Malted barley, yeast, water, hops. With Cobra, to get this extra smooth taste, the recipe, you talk about craft beers today, I always laugh when I hear about craft beers. I mean, we're the ultimate craft beer. And we've got all these other ingredients as well, maize and rice and wheat and four, four varieties of hops to give it this taste. This is mission, we're in a business school, let's talk business school talk, mission. Something you can measure, our finest ever Indian beer, global beer brand. And you know, this was a mission from day one, when I'd never sold a bottle of beer in my life, and it is my mission to this day. It was against all odds. As I said, Kingfisher was here for eight years before we started. Carlsberg was in every Indian restaurant. Beer brands are old. I would challenge you, how many beer brands do you know that are household names today that are less than 100 years old? Less than 100 years old, I challenge you. Carlsberg, 150 years old. Stella Artois, 14th century. Grosch, 400th anniversary last year. 
Cronenberg, 1664. I could go on, yeah? And the thing is, not just big, but big bucks. Our first item of point of sale, by the way, item of marketing, we couldn't even afford beer glasses, was a flimsy table tent card with green and black printing. We couldn't afford full color, telling customers what Cobra beer was all about. So we're against all the odds, and nobody thinks you stand a chance. Your own family, to start with. My father had become commander-in-chief of the Central Army in India, 350,000 people under his command in Lucknow headquarters. Whenever I got a break from Bangalore, I'd go up to Lucknow for a little bit of relaxation. <coughs> and dad, isn't this great? My own beer company, my own brand, my own business, entrepreneurship, isn't it great, dad? Now, I knew I couldn't get any money from him because Indian Army officers got paid very badly. At my wedding in the speech, he said, I never had to dissuade my sons from joining the army. All I did was show them my paycheck. Okay, so no money from dad. But I thought some emotional support, some moral support, forget it. What are you doing? All this education? And you're becoming an import-export voila. <laughs> Get a proper job. Become a banker. Go there. Anyway, he, he's, he became a great fan once we succeeded. Um, business school, I'm sorry, some of these things, we've got to go to business school, business school classroom, Michael Porter, five forces, market entry analysis. I would have failed every five of these. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't even have started. Bargaining power of supplies, they've got you over a barrel, sorry about the pun. Um, threat of new entrants, threat of substitute products, bargaining power buyers, industry rivals. I mean, forget it. I shouldn't even have tried. Um, but look at some of the things in my favor. The growth of lager. 99% before just about everyone in this room was born. 99% was ale, 1% lager in this country. It's just flipped because we've been globalized, because everywhere else in the world, beer is basically lager. How many of you enjoy and like curry, eat Indian food regularly? Yeah, just about every hand. We're a nation of curryholics. The, the chart now is it's crossed 10,000. It's actually nearly 12,000. We all eat Indian food, and the most popular drink with Indian food is lager beer. So I had that in my favor as well. This question of um, adapting or dying, in the journey, there are many times I've had to make decisions where if you don't adapt, you've got a dream, you've got a mission, you will die. I had to make the decision, for example, six years down the road. My, my partner left. He just didn't believe the plane would take off. He said, I'm out of this. I hate the weather in England. I'm going back to India. These are my terms. I bought out Arjun on his own terms. We left, parted amicably, we're still the best of friends. The year after he left, the sales doubled. Not because he left, the year <laughs> after. <laughs> and sales doubled, my problems of importing Cobra from India quadrupled. The brewery just couldn't cope. Quality problems, consistent problems. Real problems, availability, con containers not reaching, getting stuck, it was just a nightmare. So I went to my customers and I said, look, I'm going to have to brew under license in the UK. They said, oh, no, 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 you're an authentically imported Indian beer. You brew under license in here, you'll be just like Carlsberg, just like Kingfisher, just like everyone else. We won't buy from you. You will fail. You will lose your business. Rock hard place. What do you do? And I remembered from the Indian restaurateurs that gave me my chance. They always put their customers first. And when I say Indian restaurateurs, two thirds of them are Bangladeshis, one third. Nepalese, Sri Lankans, Pakistanis, Indians. And I remembered customers first, consumer first, and I surveyed the consumers and I said, what is the most important thing to you as a consumer about Cobra? Is it the less gassy, extra smooth taste? Is it the fact that it's a premium beer? Is it the fact that it's brute and authentic Indian recipe? Is it the fact that it's imported from India? Surveyed thousands of consumers. You know what they said? The most important thing to them by a long shot, extra smooth, less gassy. The least important thing to them, by a long way, imported from India. I'm brewing here. I moved the production over here. All my quality problems went away. And I was able to brew top quality, world-class beer, world-class packaging, and on draft. And those same customers of mine, wholesalers, who said they would never buy from me, bought more than, more than ever from me. And the lesson there is always to ask the consumer and to adapt or die. So we're now, from having started in Bangalore, we brewed for the first seven years, then brewed in Bedford, in Europe, Belgium, Burton on Trent, and in three breweries in India. Uh, we're distributed now in the Indian restaurants. Uh, all, well, virtually all the Indian restaurants sell it. There's still about 160 in this country that don't. 
I'll try and get them. <laughs> um, and uh, Chinese and Thai restaurants now are starting to sell it. Supermarkets, you get it just about everywhere. All the independents, multiples, cash and carries. And this is the area of real growth for us, is the pubs and the bars where we're now, and the exports are about 40 countries. These are my 10 Ps of building a business. Product, price, place, promotion, those are your four Ps of marketing. People, finance, spelled PH, can't do anything without the money. Um, real challenge, by the way. That's one of the biggest challenges in the early days was raising money. Passion, you've got to believe in what you're doing. Profit, partnership, and principles. And this can apply to any business. Um, the team. We started off in Fulham, then on the King's Road above an antique shop. And we put out an advert for two salespeople in the early days. We got lots of people wanting it. We selected our two people. The person who came third said, please, please give me the job. I know I can do this. We said, sorry, you can only afford two. We can, sorry, well, maybe you know, next time. No, 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 please, please. I I'll do it for commission only. Said, commission only? <laughs> what have we got to lose? OK, fine. Have you got a car? No. He said, just give me some samples. What are you doing at the moment? He was working in an off license in the East End of London. He'd come over from Pakistan on political asylum as a Pakistani Christian. His English was appalling. He said, just give me some samples. And we gave him the samples. And before he left, he said, wait, wait, wait. These two people, what's their target? We said, to sell 100 cases of Cobra in a week. How long are you doing them to achieve this target? We said, we're giving them one month. He set off and achieved the target within two weeks. We gave him a job. A couple of weeks later, my wife and I were going out for dinner. The whole of the first floor of this apartment had been converted into the office. So Samson was there in the sitting room on the phone. Nine o'clock at night. Samson, what are you doing here? Go home. I'm phoning the restaurants. I'm on call number 26. I set myself a target of 30 this evening. When I reach 30, I let myself out. That attitude, I always say we hire for will rather than skill. Ideally both. But it's that will, that attitude that means more than anything else. He has stood by me through everything. I wouldn't be here talking to you without Samson by my side for over two decades. Um, and that's how he started. I'm going to ask you a question. Please be honest with me and yourselves. This is not a test. This is just give me the real answer. Are you creative? How many of you think you're creative? Just hands up, please. Just keep them up. I just want to see this. Mm, it's a little more than I normally see, but about right. Half. Half the hands. The talk I was giving just now earlier. Same, wasn't it? About half the hands went up. Um, anywhere in the world, about half the hands go up. All through my childhood, I was told, Karen, you're doing well at your studies. Keep going. You'll do well, but you're not creative. <laughs> Why? <coughs> because I couldn't draw. I was useless at art. I still can't draw. I tried music. I passed grade one piano. <laughs> And then everyone, including my piano teacher, said, well done, now don't take it any further. <laughs> don't turn <don't> deaf. <laughs> so all through my studies at university in India, university here, just not creative. And it's when I started my business, I realized one of the skills that I have in abundance is the ability to be creative. And all through my childhood had been suppressed, wasted, wasted. And I just think every one of you didn't put your hand up, I can be creative. You're all definitely creative. And it manifests itself in many ways. I'll give you example after example. This is one way when we repackaged Cobra just over a decade ago, these iconic bottles that you all now know. The inspiration from this came from Gro Roman, Greek, and Persian columns where sculpture tells a story. And this is the first and only time a consumer product tells its story visually as part of its packaging. And each one of the icons stands for a stage in the Cobra beer story. And we're now coming up with some new Cobra beer glasses. Watch the space. They are beer glasses like you've never seen before. Um, and it's just wonderful to be innovative and creative in what you do. King Cobra, this is the product we produce in Belgium. We talk about craft beers. This is a Cobra recipe, but with an ale yeast in a double fermentation into a lager in Belgium, unpasteurized with the yeast in the bottle. Um, and it's just the ultimate craft beer. Most non-alcoholic beers are disgusting. We've produced one that's actually drinkable and cans, and it can go on. Our first advertising campaign, this is Curryholic Dave, uh, spokesperson. 
The bear from Bangalore that lets you eat more curry. The bear curry holics adore, it lets them eat more. The less gassy, more classy curry holics beer. This was Saatchi and Saatchi. It established us as the best beer to drink with Indian food. Did a great job. Um, then we had our first television campaign, also done by Saatchi and Saatchi. And they were going to film this in India. They said, look, can we go and do this in India? I said, please, go on. Indian beer, shoot the advert in India. Great. They said, oh, you better hear the budget before we leave. Luckily, I was sitting down. A million dollars just to produce the commercial. I said, what? Why? Million dollars? That's ridiculous. I've got to pay to show it. No, 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 look, look. Guinness, Stella, they all pay a million dollars. OK, you're a small company. While we're out there, we'll make two films, two for the price of one. A very generous of you. Thank you, thank you. But what about Bollywood producing more films in Hollywood? What about India having a highly developed in advertising industry? Now, come on. Oh, oh, we hadn't considered all that. But the quality won't be good enough. We found the best director, best production company. Two people flew out from Saatchi and Saatchi, and we produced two commercials for a fraction of a million dollars. Outsourcing, right sourcing. A win for British creativity, Saatchi and Saatchi. Win for India, Indian production. Win for Kofu beer. If I can, I will try and show you this. Nope. We'll move on. Uh, and the, then sometimes you don't get it right. We then ended up, years down the road, spending a million pounds on a commercial. One million pounds on one commercial. And again, I don't think this is going to work. These have not been embedded. And that was a complete waste of money, million pounds. Sorry about this. They're good, fun, fun films, but uh, we'll move on. Uh, we're back on track now. Just got some good news today. We won some more gold medals. I think this figure is going to go up to 88 gold medals. I'm boasting, but I'm proud of it. That mission of brewing the finest ever Indian beer, making it a global beer brand, we are the finest ever Indian beer by miles. And I'm boasting, but I'm sorry. I, I, I can't help it. <laughs> uh, this, again, is not going to work. Nick, it, we will move on. Um, this the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, that nobody saw coming. Uh, nearly lost my business for the third time. Formed a joint venture with, with Coors, and including in India, the Cobra Partnership and Milton Coors in India. Coors is now a $20 billion company. And although we're a huge company and a small company, we had similar culture, shared values, and this one word, integrity, which we can speak about later. Um, before I conclude, partnership with the community, I think this is important. We formed our own foundation in 2005, the Cobra Foundation. And it shocked me as to how few British companies actually have their own charitable foundations. And the way we do it is we give beer away for charitable fundraising events on a regular basis. So one example is the Lord Mayor of London has a curry lunch every year. A thousand people in the Guild Hall pay over £100 each per ticket. Auctions, silent auctions, fundraising, and they raise £150,000 net for the Army Benevolent Fund, the Soldiers' Charity, every year. And Cobra Beer provides the beer for that, thousands of pounds worth of beer every single year. House of Lords, House of Commons, we have lots of competitions between us, not just legislation. <laughs> and the biggest competition is the tug of war. And the tug of war, um, don't ask who wins, uh, we always lose, but anyway. It's not. Tug of war is for Macmillan's cancer. I'm not exaggerating, even in the recessionary years, minimum £150,000 net raised for Macmillan cancer and Cobra beer, thousands of pounds of beer every year, year after year, for help fundraising for that charity. In that way, we've helped 170 different charities in this country alone. And this is our latest project, which we've now been doing for just over a year, called Cobra Foundation Baloo Water. You'll see this brand, Baloo, everywhere. This joint branded product, which we sell through the Indian restaurants, we sell it at the normal price to the wholesalers. Wholesalers at the normal price to the restaurants. Consumer buys at the normal price they pay for, for the water. The catch is this, that 100% of the profits that we make on this water, 100% of the profits we give to water aid in South Asia for clean water, sanitation, saving lives. And we handed over a check in our first year profits on this little project, 17,000 pounds. This year we won't hand over 30,000 pounds. And our target is to get to 100,000 pounds a year. We don't have to do this. It's just a great thing to do. And every business in its own way can do it. Um, when, you, when it's partnership outside the box, this is a new venture that we've started. That's my son playing football, and he did not score the goal. Um, and we've got this instant photo messaging platform, which is a combination of Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, Vine, and Dropbox. Um, again, it's, this, it, it's great fun. And our sales force are now using it, and it's instant photo messaging. 
Um, that's my cousin who I've started with. I just want to talk about leadership before we conclude. Um, Desmond Tutu, you've all heard of Desmond Tutu. Very lucky to know him because he's also an honorary fellow of Sydney Sussex College, my college at Cambridge. And when um, Nelson Mandela passed away, uh, the college asked me on my, my wife is South African on our trip to South Africa, which was literally soon after he passed away, please would you go and visit Desmond Tutu and convey the condolences of the college. So I conveyed my condolences and from then on we always call each other fellow fellow. So afterwards he said, you know, come and have breakfast and we, we had breakfast together. And I asked him, I said, what is it about Nelson Mandela? You knew him so well. The first night Nelson Mandela spent outside prison was with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So what was so special about him? What was, what was, what was it that was so special about Nelson Mandela, this great leader? He said there was one word that set him apart, and that was that he was magnanimous. He was magnanimous. I said, what do you mean by magnanimous? He said he wouldn't go to a dinner and walk out of the dinner. He'd go into the kitchen and thank the staff. He wouldn't get out of a helicopter and just get out of the helicopter. He'd thank everyone around, the pilots, and talk to them, and then go. And he was loved by everyone by being magnanimous. He served people. And then I met the Dalai Lama. How many of you met the Dalai Lama, heard him speak? Anyone heard the Dalai Lama speak? Brilliant. I thought I was absolutely inspirational. And I was lucky to meet him. And then when, when, when you meet him and he blesses you, the way he blesses you is he bumps his head against your head. And again, he kept talking about service leadership. I serve my Tibetan people. And the army, the, the, the any army officers, any former army officers here? Sandhurst? Yeah. Motto of Sandhurst, please? Serve to lead. Serve to lead. Indian Army, where my father was commissioned, the Indian Military Academy, the motto there is, and I will just paraphrase it, the safety, honor, and welfare of your country comes first always and every time. The safety and welfare of the troops that you command comes second always and every time. Your own safety and welfare comes last always and every time. So why do you think they call the services? service leadership. Um, when we did the deal with Molson Coors, uh, the joint venture, under the most trying circumstances, they came this close to losing everything, they said we're doing this primarily for three reasons. One, we want you as the founder entrepreneur to stay and be chairman of this joint venture, which I agreed to. Secondly, we want your team, people like Samson I spoke about. I said I'm sure they'll agree. Thirdly, you have an extraordinary brand. I said thank you for the compliment. They said, no, 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 we have six criteria to fulfill if you've got an extraordinary brand. So here they are. First, an extraordinary brand tells a story based on an undeniable brand truth. The example here is Guinness. In our case, that undeniable brand truth is the extra smooth, less gassy taste. Second, an extraordinary brand lives by, never compromises on its principles. IKEA is the example. I hope in my story that's come across. Third is they have an instantly recognizable and iconic look. The example is Absolute Vodka. You've got it in front of you, the Cobra beer bottles. Four is deliver a unique, relevant, uh, and consistent experience. The example is Starbucks coffee, and the beer you're drinking is a naturally produced product. The ingredients are natural. Each brew is yeast fermenting. It's a natural process. The raw, raw materials change every year, the seasons, and yet you, as a consumer, expect every bottle of Cobra to taste exactly like the one before. And yet with fine wine, as consumers, you're willing to pay 100 pounds a bottle, and if the taste is different the next year, a different vintage. It's acceptable. <laughs> it's unfair, but anyway, that's life. Um, we produce hundreds of millions of bottles of beer, and everyone has to taste exactly the same. Not easy. Extraordinary brands build loyal brand champions. This, the example of this is consumers love your product so much, they'll look out for it. They expect it. They're looking forward to it. Go into a restaurant, sit down, waiter gives you the menus, what would you like to have to drink? Two Cobras, please. Sorry, we've run out of Cobra. Thank you very much. Walk to another restaurant. And we hear stories of customers doing exactly that when customers run out of Cobra. Consumers go to another restaurant. You cracked it if you've got loyal brand champions. And finally, extraordinary brands deliver extraordinary profits. I'll conclude with this story from my father. Um, I was very lucky to learn a lot from him. As I said, he ended up being Commander-in-Chief of the Central Army in India, 350,000 people under his command. 
When I first started, my first job was when I was doing my accountancy training with what is today Ernst & Young in London. And I, I was on a holiday in, in India. My father had just taken over command of a mountain division um, and become a general. And I was about to start working. I said, Dad, I need some advice about work. Could you give me some advice about work? He said, oh, you want advice about work, do you? Come and see me in my office. I had to get an appointment from his ADC to see him in his office. And I sat in his office, which was about half the size of this lecture hall. And I felt very small in that huge office. And my father gave me advice that I'll never forget all my life. And the best advice of that was this. He said, he said, son, you're starting at the bottom. You'll be given lots of jobs and tasks. The first thing when you're given a job is do it. The second thing is you do that little bit extra that you were not asked to do. And that's the best advice I've ever been given in my life because my father was always saying, take initiative, be creative, be innovative, and always go the extra mile. And this is sum what sums it all up, is our vision. I spoke about our mission earlier, but I think the vision is more important. It's your attitude. It's how you approach things. And this is our vision, to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. And I always say that is almost a definition of entrepreneurship. You come up with an idea, you want to get somewhere with the idea, you've got all the odds stacked against you, or little or no means, and you go out there and you make it happen, and most important, you try and do it with the right values. And then the sky's the limit. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, who wants to ask the first question? Yes. Yeah. You have to say who you are and where you're from and all that sort of thing, or just. Dimitri was. Uh, one second. Dimitri. Oh, there. Dimitri was Pakistan working in Deloitte, the consultant. Um, amazing talk. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Very inspiring. Um, from a from a business perspective, how did your competitors react? Well, you, I guess you didn't quite have competitors as such, but did they notice what you were doing? Did they try to compete with you? So uh, we had lots of competitors. The beer market in this country is the most competitive beer market in the world. One of the best things about Britain, by the way, is we're in one of the most open economies in the world. So good thing about that is any one of you, by the way, now can go out of this lecture hall and start your own beer brand. No license is required. You can just go and do it. Flip side of that, lots of competition. So we had huge competition. Um, and it's Mahatma Gandhi saying that first they ignore you, then they attack you, and finally they accept you. And we went through all those phases. And in the early days, some of them tried to buy us out. Once they realized, gosh, they're getting into all these restaurants, all our top distributors are stocking them, let's buy them out. And I always think, what if in those early days, somebody would have then said, okay, here's a million pounds, go away. Would we have taken that million pounds? If you read the Microsoft history, Bill Gates, they were very tempted to just get paid out a certain amount by IBM, and they would have just walked away. You wouldn't have the Microsoft you have today. Um, so we resisted that temptation and we carried on. Uh, to, and of course the other point is sometimes you've got to always uh, use that word partnership. Carlsberg was our number one enemy. Every Indian restaurant had Carlsberg. You try and find Carlsberg in Indian restaurants today, you won't find it hardly. Okay, but today my partners in Sweden are Carlsberg <laughs> because they have 45% market share there and today I'm partnering with somebody who was my competitor. Next question, who wants to ask a question? Yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, hi, thanks again for that amazing talk. Thank um, you. You mentioned trust as one of the cornerstones of building an empire. Can you give a couple examples of how that uh, you know, helped you build your empire and also, I guess, how to navigate the pitfalls of, of who to trust and how, how to make that judgment call? I have a number of examples I can give to trust. I mean, to start off with, my business partner, Arjun, who I started, we were childhood, we'd yeah, known each other since we were very young. His great-grandfather was um, head of police in Hyderabad State. My great-grandfather was an entrepreneur and a member of the upper house in India. They knew each other. His grandmother and my grandmother were at school together. My mother and his mother were at school together. So four generations we knew each other. I trusted Arjun implicitly. 
with my life, literally, I would trust him. And we're still, today, the best of friends. That trust, I could not have done it on my own. And I think you look at the history of entrepreneurs, they start as partners invariably. They don't necessarily last Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, or Bill Gates, Paul Allen, Richard Branson, his partner. Some of them do last. Um, Arjun and I didn't last, but I couldn't have done it without him. So that's one example. And then in the raising finance phases, I remember there was a bank manager, a NatWest bank manager on the Fulham, pa Fulham Road. And it was the nearest branch to us, so we opened an account there. And he said, okay, your overdraft limit is 11,000 pounds. He used to let that overdraft limit go to 26,000 pounds. In those days, I mean, 11,000 pounds today, that's like 100,000 pounds, you know, going up to a quarter of a million pounds. He said, I'm coming up to retiring. I'll lose my pension if you let me down. He trusted us. But that sort of trust you can, I can never forget. Um, the, the warehouse, the bonded warehouse, where the beer would come in without any duty paid, <coughs> The manager of that warehouse, Basil Huggins, would trust us to take beer out of there without, with the duty, and he'd take the risk on the duty until we actually paid for the beer. I can never forget that. The owner of the brewery, Mr. Barlin, when we started, and when you, I call it crossing the credibility gap in the beginning. When you have no credibility, how do you, how do you convince people to buy from you, supply you, and finance you when you have no credibility? And I call it crossing that gap because they will do those things if you have faith, confidence, and belief, and passion in your product, in your brand, and in yourself because it gives people the faith to trust you and to give you a chance. The first container of beer was being shipped from Bangalore. p and containers, container loaded. The priests blessed the beer. Containers closed, containers shipped. I didn't have the money to pay for the beer. The owner of the brewery lent me the money to pay him for the beer. He organized the finance here for me to pay him for the beer. And next week I'm flying out for their golden wedding anniversary. I have never <coughs> done business with them for the last over 20 years. But we trust each other and the best of friends. So trust lasts for generations. Their grandson, I'm now guardian to him while he's studying at Cambridge. So empires are built on trust. Right, <coughs> who was next question? Yes. You have a low degree at thank you. You have a low degree at Cambridge University. Why did you think about you becoming a solicitor, a barrister, or a charge, you know? Uh, what do you had wanted to be like that? Or you must be, uh, you should have to study your business, uh, completely different. Why can you explain, please? Okay. It's a good question. You know, why didn't I carry on be a, a lawyer, or for that matter, an accountant? Um, and I, I think that um, it was a very personal thing, and I, and I genuinely looked at both options. Accountants, uh, I was lucky to work in a big, and again, a lot of entrepreneurs, by the way, never had proper jobs. And one thing I'm very grateful for is that I worked for a firm like Ernst & Young. But even in those days, the part I was with was Arthur Young that merged with Ernst & Winnie to make Ernst & Young. The London office was thousands of people, and it was a global company. So I had that experience of working in a professional environment. I learned all about the good things about a big organization, the office politics and all the bad things. Um, but I realized it wasn't for me. Um, I remember the first day we started, I was talking to one of the people who started with me, a new graduate, and I, we're at the bar. We'd taken out for drinks in the evening, and I said, what are you going to do, do you think? He said, I think I'll end up being a partner of this firm. And sure enough, he's one of the senior partners there today. He's a good <laughs> friend of mine. And he asked me, what do you think, what are you going to do, do you think? I said, I think I'll start my own business one day. So I always had that yearning to do my own thing. And when I was at Cambridge studying law, I thought I'd be a barrister. I used to go down, sit on trials, visit the inns of court. And then for me, it would have been too restrictive. I like with business, the blue sky, the limitless opportunity, um, you know, with Cobra, with Pictoso, with whatever you're doing, it's endless opportunities and you're in control of your own destiny, which is what I, what I love. Yes, right at the back, and then I'll come to you. Thank you. My name's Terrence and I'm here. Um, so you clearly are extremely successful in so many different ways. You're an entrepreneur, you're a public servant, um, and it seems you're involved in so many different walks of life and that you're doing everything. But we also know stories of entrepreneurs who 
have proven that if you want to do something well, you also have to not do a whole lot of things. And I can imagine you must be presented with opportunities all the time that are very interesting. So I was wondering if you could walk us through your criteria, your logic on deciding what you do and what you choose not to do as well. Okay. Thank, thank you. The, the first, I would say the first 10 years, 10 years of my story, I did nothing but just cobra beer. Eat, sleep, drink, entrepreneurship, business, getting that, you know, the brand to take off, all the ups and downs. My first stepping out of that world, and by the way, two of us starting, I'm always grateful that it was two of us who started because I've done everything in the business from keeping the books to doing the telesales, doing the field sales, delivering the product, being involved in manufacturing, marketing, everything, I've done it myself. So now with a big global giant like Molson Coors, whenever I go to any part of the business, I've done that myself, which is a great advantage. Then you've got to learn how to delegate and build a team. And once you start building a team, and you, you, it's very difficult to be taken out of your business because most people don't do it. I then w went on the Cranfield Business Growth Program and I suddenly realized there was a world outside my business and interacted with other entrepreneurs and learned from them. And I thought, wow, I got open to lifelong learning. Then I attended the course here, the London Business School, the Entrepreneurial Growth Program. I started with 40 people on that course. Today it's about 150, 160 people and waitlisted within minutes from around the world. Then I went to the Harvard Business School and did my course there. So suddenly you start getting outside your business and you realize the benefit that brings to your business and your own personal development. Then I started getting involved in public life, sitting on the National Employment Panel. Then I became the youngest university chancellor in the country. One thing leads to another. And the next thing I was in the House of Lords. And the House of Lords is wonderful because it allows you as a crossbench peer to also carry on your career as well as contribute as a parliamentarian. So the difficult challenge, of course, is managing to keep all those balls in the air and, and give them all your attention and focus, which I managed to do with the support of a good team. But the first few years, there's no way I could have done anything other than just complete focus on getting my business off the ground. And then the, the success then is to build a team around you to help you do all these other things. You want to comment? Yes. Hi, my name is Mayor. Uh, thanks very much for that. A uh, really quick question. You know, on the screen, you showed a chart of uh, the growth of uh, sales in lager, I think, in the UK, and then sales of, um, I guess, Indian. Indian restaurants. Indian restaurants, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering um, is that something that you had kept in mind when you were starting up or before you'd started up? It was kind of like, a, well, this happened to coincide with. It, it was something I was observing. And when I went into business, I was very conscious that I could see that people getting interested in different types of beer. So that was the time when Corona beer started to break into the market, when Peroni beer was imported by Pizza Express. And people started to drink beyond the standard lagers and beers and ales. So I could see that starting. Today, of course, you've got this whole movement in craft beers. And we're ahead of the game in that sense. And with food, I could see Indian food just getting more and more popular and becoming a way of life. And today, I mean, you know, Indian food, not just the restaurants, you can buy in ingredients to cook Indian food um, at home. You can get takeaways from restaurants. You can you know, get some of the best Indian food in the world here. In fact, I was with the British government in Delhi launching a British curry festival at the Moria Hotel in Delhi. I mean, talk about taking coals to Newcastle. Uh, so that was very much part of that wave that I could see, that I could be part of. In the restaurants, I had my breakthrough strategy. Because I had no money when I started to put into marketing or advertising, I said, how am I going to get people to discover my product? Well, because everyone likes lago beer with Indian food, if I can get the Indian restaurants to stock my product on the restaurant tables, then everyone goes to Indian food, to, to Indian restaurants, everyone. We've done a lot of research on this, whether it's ABC One, whether it's living in a village, or living in the city of London, everyone, all age groups, all age groups, and even our children, eat Indian food. So I said, everyone goes to those restaurants. If I can get people to know my product in that restaurant, then they'll buy it in the supermarkets, then they'll buy it in the pubs and the bars. So that breakthrough strategy, the challenge was getting the restaurants to sell the product. We'd go into the restaurants, and the brewery, by the way, at this stage, you've got this 330 ml bottle, yeah? Do you all know Cobra and the double-sized bottles, the big bottles? The brewery, we asked them for this. We said, this is what people are used to in the UK, or draft beer. I said, draft beer? Are you out of your mind? Sending 50-liter kegs full of beer and empty kegs back all the way to Bangalore? 
No. Small bottles, India. Those of you been to, how many have been to India? Um, India? Big bottles of beer, yeah? 90, in those days it was 99% big bottles. Even today it's 90%, almost 90% big bottles. They said, we don't produce these. It means change parts on the production line. It means new molds with the bottle manufacturers. In fact, we think you're going to fail. If you're around in a year's time, we'll give you your small bottles. And true to their word, they gave us our small bottles. So we start off with these big bottles. We'd go into the restaurants, Park Albert, a little bit ahead, walk in. Here we are, brand new Indian beer, authentically imported, extra smooth, less gassy, great. There's the door. We've already got Kingfisher, we've got Carlsberg, we've got other Indian beers. We don't need you. Oh, and by the way, it's in this big bottle. Yeah, please leave. <laughs> Look, it's extra smooth, it's less gassy, it's delicious, it goes really well in your food. Try it. Sorry, we don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> Two thirds of them, Bangladeshis. Muslims, religious reasons, don't drink. The other one third, a lot of them Pakistanis, Muslims, don't drink. So we've had it, this isn't gonna go nowhere. <laughs> then they said, look, okay, okay, okay. You say this product is so brilliant, leave a couple of bottles, we'll try it with our regulars. If they like it, we'll put in our first order. If our wider customers like it, we will reorder. And I'll never forget that chance that the Indian restaurateurs, when I say Indian restaurant, curry restaurants gave us. And of course, then your product's gotta deliver. And we got 100% reorder rate almost within, from day one. And the other thing was the big bottles, the way we convinced them, we turned a disadvantage into an advantage. So this big bottle is the way beer is sold in India. When you order beer in India, two of you sit down, one big bottle, two glasses, waiter shows you the bottle, you check that it's chilled, you check that it's the right brand, you check it hasn't been opened, <laughs> it's opened in front of you, and then it's poured. And then you share it between yourselves. You share the beer. And I said, don't people order Indian food for the table? Don't you all share Indian food? But <laughs> tell your waiters, put the big bottles on the table. People will share the beer like they share the food. As long as they're drinking responsibly, you will end up selling more beer. Next thing is, your waiters can do other work because people are sharing the beer. They can do other work. Freeze up your waiters. The next thing is, people at a table say, what are they drinking? Looks like a bottle of wine. Not a bottle of wine, it's a bottle of beer. I'll try it. It spreads like wildfire around the restaurant. So you turn a huge disadvantage into an advantage. And that's how Cobra beer spread from the Indian restaurants, then to the supermarkets, and eventually.